Bigger thing than Cecil Tuffy. Pretty good shape over there. Yeah, same. <laughs> same old, same old. Yeah. 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 That's okay. Yeah, I haven't had a <laughs> 
Good morning. Good morning. 
I'm Pastor Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives here across the street and around the world. We're glad you're all here today. want to make sure um, that you know communion is open to all, regardless of age or membership status or anything like that. Uh, If when you came in, you did not pick up a communion kit and you would like one, just raise your hands. We'll make sure that you get a communion kit. Looks like everybody has what they need. Now, these new communion kits we've got are a little tricky. Um, You want to open the side that's got a little divot in it that allows the cellophane to come off. You get to the wafer. Then you go to the opposite side to the other ear to open the tinfoil to get to the juice. Uh, The glue is tight on these things. So... Be careful not to squeeze the cup when you open it, otherwise you'll have a little geyser of juice. That's why you're all armed with napkins. And um, anyway, just be mindful of that. If you want to get a head start opening that before communion, please feel free to do so because they are a little bit challenging. When we get to communion, we'll be omitting the spoken Lord's Prayer today because we're singing the Lord's Prayer Uh, a little later, and I'll say more about that, but just be mindful that we are omitting the spoken Lord's Prayer today. A special welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. We're glad that you're with us as well. You also are part of our Havity Grace United Methodist Church family. We hope wherever you are, you are safe. If it's your first time visiting here with us, never gotten a letter from me, please fill out one of those little blue cards that's found in the pew rack and drop it in the offering plate because we want to connect with those who worship here with us. There is a clipboard coming around the space on which you can sign up to make financial donations uh, to feed the hungry. If you'd like to make that commitment, the page is full on the front and just flip it up to sign on the back. And you have permission to get up and move around the space to pass it on to the next person. Our Ruth Jessup circle of our uh, women's fellowship is sponsoring a Super Bowl season collecting non-perishable items for Grace Place. Please check the bulletin for the kinds of items that they need. Easter cantata rehearsals have begun, 7 p.m. on Thursdays. All voices are welcome. Please come and and join that opportunity. Out in the narthex, also in the red cupboard under the breezeway, there are some Valentine's cards slash thinking of you cards made by one of our uh, young people as a part of her Patriot Project. We are welcome to take those and use them. They're being made available for us to use. And you can check the bulletin for more details on that as well. Out in the narthex and in the uh, display rack are these purple forms. If you'd like to make a gift to missions in memory or in honor of a loved one, this is an opportunity to do so. There's information on the form as well as in the bulletin about how to do that. So in lieu of Easter lilies, we're making missional donations. Now, out in the narthex, there's a supply of bags. Each bag has an address, paper clip to it, and in the bag is information about our congregation. I'm inviting you to take a bag or two or three, some of them are right close to each other, and deliver them. I've noticed that uh, when the price of housing went up, and with COVID, Vacant lots in Havity Grace started sprouting homes. So these addresses are either new homes, newly renovated homes, or homes where I've noticed somebody just moved in. So I'm inviting you to take a bag, add something to it if you want, a Hostess Twinkie or a McDonald's hot apple pie, whatever. You can put in there, right? Hang it on the doorknob. That's all you got to do. You don't have to talk to any scary people, right? <laughs> If somebody pops out the door and says, what are you doing? You say, not not on me. My crazy pastor asked me to do this, (laughs) right? And you can call him because his contact information is inside the bag. You can complain to him. Okay, so it's an opportunity to reach out to some new neighbors. Please feel free to take a bag or two or three with you. Friends, we're in sacred space. We're invited into sacred time. Let's all take a deep breath in. And let it out slowly as we let go of the concerns that we have brought with us and center ourselves in the presence of God's Holy Spirit as we invite David to call us to worship. Dave? Good morning. 
Please stand in heart or body and join me in the call to worship. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, and give thanks to God's holy name. In the midst of the congregation, we will praise the Lord. Great is the Lord, and greatly be to be praised. God's greatness is unsearchable. We will exalt our Lord in the name, and bless God's name forever. As a sign of reconciliation, Jesus Christ has made between us and God, and our desire to be reconciled with others. We announce God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Please be seated, and let's pray together. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Grant that we, your people, enlightened by your word, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, now and forever. Amen. The epistle lesson this morning comes from Corinthians. The Apostle Paul is writing to the new Christians at Corinth to answer some hard questions about how to live as Jesus' disciples in a pagan culture. Christians did not believe idols were real, but their neighbors did. How were they to navigate life under these conditions? Now, concerning food, Sacrifice to idols, we know that. All of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to the idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact, there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. 
For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of the idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to point of eating the sacrifice of, to the idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you are thus sin against the members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will not eat meat, so that I, so that I may not be the cause of them to fall. <clears throat> the gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke. On the way to Jerusalem and the cross, Jesus is teaching when he encounters a woman in need of healing. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand upright. But Jesus saw her, and he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which, ought, on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered to him and said, you hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger? and lead it away to give it water. And ought not the woman, the daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. invite uh, Lorelai and, and Rain and Rainbow to join me up here for just a moment. Have a seat right there. And while they're coming, I want to greet those who are online with us. So I wanted to say hello today to uh, Bailey and Adeline and Emmett and Addie and also to Autumn and Rory and Charlie and Max and Sloan and to Wyatt and Will and Amelia, and to Maddie and Henry, and also uh, say hello to Iris and Hazel and Lillian and Michael. And if I didn't say your name, I welcome you too, and I'm glad that you're joining with us today. We're glad to have you. There we go. Come on down. And I'm going to ask you to stand up. And I, you, won't have to, you won't even have to sit down. We're going to all be standing for just a moment. So let's all stand. Just, you just heard a Bible story about a woman who was bent over. So I want you all to pretend and bend over like this, right? You bend over. And what is the only thing you can see from that position? Um, the floor and our shoes. The floor and our shoes. That's right. Now, <laughs> staying bent over like that. Let's pretend you wanted to look up in the sky and see a bird or look at the ceiling. What would you have to do without standing up to see the sky? What would you have to do? Right? You have to turn your head like that, sideways. Somebody this morning said, well, you could lay down. Yeah, sort of, on your side. But it's hard on your neck, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to look up when you're bent over. But you know what? Jesus healed the woman so that she could stand up straight. Can you stand up straight? Yeah. Now you can have a seat. Very good. 
<laughs> so the thing about Jesus healing the woman who was bent over so that she could stand up straight is that he had to break some rules to do that. So we're going to talk about rules today. What are some rules that you know about at school? What are some school rules that you have? Um, no hitting and being rude. No hitting other students or teachers or anybody else or being rude. Good rule. Any other rules you can think of at school? They play. You play nicely with one another? Yeah. Yeah. Um, try your best. To try your very best in doing your schoolwork. That's a good rule. Yeah. Any other rules you can think of? Rules? Do you, when you're in class and the teacher asks a question, do you shout out the answer? No. no. What do you do? Raise your hand, right? And then the teacher calls on you, right? That's another kind of a rule, right? How about at home? Do you have any rules at home? Things not to do or that you should do? Um, um, to just, just not run but walk. Not run but walk inside, right? Yeah, so you don't crash into things or people. Okay, good rule. Any other rules at home that you have? Um, no, no, like, um... Talking so loud. Use your inside voice instead of your outdoor voice. Yep, good rule. Any other rules you have at home? Uh, not to use so much shampoo. Not to use so much shampoo, right? So you don't, <laughs> you don't use up stuff, right? Yeah. That's a, okay, as a rule. Yeah. How, speaking of shampoo, how many of you have a rule at home to wash your hands before you eat? Yeah. I think we do that. How many of you have a rule at home to brush your teeth before you go to bed? Yeah, that's a rule, right? So, so I think there's three kinds of rules. There's those rules that are about, so we don't break stuff, right? Like running around in the house you might crash into something and break it. So rules so we don't break stuff. Okay. Then there's those rules that protect us and other people. They're about safety. Like, don't run in the street in front of cars. That's a good rule, right? Yeah, that's a safety rule. And then there are those rules that help us get along together. I think in some ways those are the most important. That's why we raise our hands, take turns, play nicely. These are all rules about how we get along together. Yeah, important rules. So the thing is, Jesus broke some rules that day in order to heal the woman so she could stand up straight. And Jesus did that because God loves us so much. God loves us so much that Jesus could break rules. Okay? So here's what I want you to do this week. Raise your hands if you're going to brush your teeth sometime this week. Yes. Raise your hands if you're going to wash your hands sometime this week. Yep. Okay. When you wash your hands or brush your teeth, I want you to say to yourself, Jesus loves me. Can you remember that for me? Jesus loves me when you're brushing your teeth, when you're washing your hands, because God's love is so great that Jesus is willing to break rules to show us God's love. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your great love of us. Thank you for sending us Jesus, and thank you that Jesus broke rules to show us your love. And Lord God, help us to love other people. Help us to love other people, sometimes by following the rules, to keep them safe, and so that we are kind to them. Through Jesus, our friend, amen. So what's going to remind you of God this week? When you do what? Um, wash your hands and brush your teeth. So wash our hands or brush our teeth, and what are we going to say to ourselves? Um, God loves us. God loves us. Jesus loves me. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for helping me out today.
Well done, choir. Anytime you go a cappella and then come back in, there's always the danger that you've gone flat. And boy, that, does that sound bad when the piano comes on again, but they were, they were on pitch. So good job. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. So friends, some Bible stories seem really, really out of reach for us. They're from different times, different places, different cultures, and they seem almost inaccessible to us. But a little digging, just a little digging, shows us that Jesus, in our two scripture lessons today, is putting forth a love ethic, a love ethic to guide us in living, a moral guidepost, if you will. And that love ethic is this, that love rules that love rules over rules. So Jesus is teaching in a synagogue one Sabbath day. And this woman comes in after Jesus has started to speak. Maybe because she has waited to slip in unnoticed. You know how folk do, right? Sit in the back, you know, slip in a little late. Maybe because that would be the easiest way to avoid people's glares. Because it was understood that those who had physical problems or who were ill, that that was God's punishment for their sin. And for 18 long years, this woman had been bent over. She'd been bent over. Now, nothing suggests this meeting was planned by her or planned by Jesus that day. Right in the middle of the worship service on the Sabbath with the religious leaders present, Jesus sees her. He notices her as He notices all of us. He calls her over to where He is sitting because those who were leading sat. That was the custom. And he says to her, you are set free from your ailment. You are set free. He does not say, your sins are forgiven you. He does not cast out any demons. This is not an exorcism. He doesn't even say, you are healed. He says, you are set free from your ailment. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from what has her bent over. And that is why Jesus uses the, the comparison, the metaphor, quoting the law, because he's quoting the law against the law, when he says, even animals are freed from their stall and led away to be watered on the Sabbath. They need a drink. They are freed A man with dementia that I knew of was struggling to say something to his daughter that she could not understand. And his particular kind of dementia was the kind where his thinking was absolutely clear, but the part that processed speech was impacted. So, how, think how frustrating that would be to know what you want to say but be unable to Form it at the time you need to. So he's trying to say something and she can't understand it. And finally, what he was able to get out was this. Might not have been what he, this might not have been what he originally intended to say, but it's what he said to her. When will I be set free? When will I be set free? What a heartbreaking question. And how appropriate. It was one for which she had no answer. But Jesus not only sets this woman free, He touches her. In the act of healing, He touches her. Here in the synagogue on the Sabbath in front of the religious leaders who know every detail of the law, He touched a woman, a woman who was not His wife, His mother, His sister, or His daughter. He breaks the law. 
again. Twice. He heals on the Sabbath and he touches a woman. Now, friends, the Sabbath is important. It makes God's people special. And I think it's still important today. It, it, the Sabbath gives us spiritual health. It gives us mental health. It gives us emotional health. It allows us to rest. Jesus knows that. He's breaking the law on purpose here. And he knows what he's doing. He is striking a blow for justice. He is demonstrating what we're called to do when we go out into the world to free those who are bent over by injustice. You see, Jesus here is an agitator. He's an agitator. I'm old enough to remember when Spiro Agnew was vice president. Some of you remember that too. He had some interesting rhetoric that he used from time to time. And one of the phrases that came up in those days was, well, these aren't people from our community. These are outside agitators. They've come in to stir things up. Well, Jesus is an inside agitator. He's stirring things up. He's breaking the law for a reason. She too, he says, is a child of Abraham. And he is applying the love ethic of Jesus. He is applying the love ethic of God to show compassion to one in need. The story has been told about Janet Wolfe. Janet Wolfe was the first female United Methodist pastor appointed to a church in Tennessee. She was appointed to a four-point charge, which is... Methodist jargon for four churches served by one pastor. And the typical scenario would be you preach three times Sunday morning and one time Sunday evening at the fourth church, but there's different configurations. Sometimes a four-church charge, sometimes it's called a four-point circuit, okay? I I had a seminary classmate that had a seven-point circuit in Western Virginia, not West Virginia, Western Virginia. Hmm. I think it almost drove her nuts. <laughs> she, she could not get any of those seven churches to worship in any of their other buildings. You know. So, it's announced that she's been appointed. One church member immediately said, I'm going to burn down this church building if a woman is in the pulpit. I will not allow that to happen. And the district superintendent backed down. And he split that church off from the other three and appointed a man there and left her with the remaining three churches. And then you know what happens. The people in those churches decided they'd go off to the fourth church where the man was preaching. This is all before she gets there, right? And then when she did, when she and her family moved into the parsonage, somebody organized a public demonstration against her. I got to tell you, This woman was a lot braver than I am. (laughs) She still went, even though she knew it would be difficult. Her kids riding the bus to school, the other kids would move away from them when they sat down and called her kids children of Satan. No one would sit with them at lunch at school. Now, let me pause here and say several things. One. Yes, children can be cruel to other children, but children don't think up phrases like children of Satan. You know that came from the parents. Second, lest we think this only happens in Tennessee, there's a church on this district that received a female pastor when she graduated from seminary. She graduated just a couple years ahead of me. And in that community, they called her the handmaiden of Satan. Now, she loved those people, and 25 years later, she retired from that same church, and they loved her too. Let me also say this. During World War II, when there was a shortage of preachers, my mother actually led a church in Tennessee as a graduate student. Women could not be ordained in those days, but she was their leader. She was their pastor. 
and they accepted her. Now, there were good things that happened in that appointment. There was a neighbor who baked a a fresh loaf of sourdough bread every day and brought it over to the parsonage. The bus driver figured out what was going on. She picked up Janet's kids first. That way, instead of kids moving away, they just didn't sit near them, which is a little less cruel, I suppose. There was a member of the church who was the cafeteria lady, and she always sat with Janet's kindergartner so she wouldn't have to eat alone. Well, in the course of time, Janice started a community Bible study, and the deal with this, again, she's braver than I am, the deal with this was that when folk came into the Bible study, and she'd, she'd invited them to invite their friends and neighbors, you know, to join it, the people were allowed to write scripture references on little pieces of paper and drop them in a basket, and then she would pull these out, and that, you know, they would discuss different scripture passages that people chose. One, one week, the story was of the bent-over woman that we just heard from Luke. And they talked about what makes us bend over in life, what leaves us bent, what kind of hardships or fears or, or systemic things like racism or sexism or classism cause people to live bent-over lives. Well, not long after that, she got a phone call 2 a.m. on a Sunday. Now, let me tell you, you never want to get a phone call at 2 in the morning, but when you're a pastor, you especially don't want to get one 2 in the morning on a Sunday, especially if, like me, you're sometimes known to stay up late Saturday night finishing the sermon. We call those Saturday night specials, just saying. So, she gets this phone call from a church member named Deanna, whose husband had beaten her up and kicked her with his steel-toed boots, and Deanna needed a ride to the hospital. The doctor who stitched her up said, what'd you do to set him off? And Janet's standing there with her parishioner, and she's wondering, what am I going to do tomorrow morning? Both sides of this family are going to be present in worship the husband's family, and the wife's family. Well, the sun rose, and Janet got to church, and she started the service, and she got to the joys and concerns, and in walks Deanna at the back of the church. You know, late, maybe people won't won't notice. And Janet's there thinking, what am I going to say? What should I do? And by this time, the bruising and the swelling have started, and and Deanna is black and blue and purple and green, and there are stitches all down the side of her face. And everyone there turned around and looked at her, and no one said a single solitary word. Until finally, finally, Deanna's sister-in-law, her husband's sister, stood up and said, you are a daughter of Abraham. You are a daughter of Abraham. And then one by one, each of the women in that little Bible study stood up and said, yes, you are a daughter of Abraham. And you know, that church started a battered women's shelter that became the largest one in the state of Tennessee. Folks, let's give God a hand praise. That's... That's a miracle. That's a miracle. When you can make that kind of lemonade from that kind of lemon, that's a miracle. You see, Jesus doesn't stick to the normal limits. And he is making the authorities nervous. You know, we can't just have miracles willy-nilly here, people. We've got to have order in the place. But God is love. And love is much bigger than any of us can imagine. And so, friends, we know the rest of the story, and glory, hallelujah, when they tried to box Jesus up by crucifying him and killing him as a common criminal, God breaks all the rules and raises Jesus to new life. And that is the ultimate love ethic. That is the ultimate love ethic for us, that God would do that for you and for me. Now, along comes the Apostle Paul, you know, generation later sort of, and he applies Jesus' love ethic 
in today's reading for the folk at Corinth. Now, the new Christians at Corinth had been used to, to, to sacrificing animals to idols. And much of the meat sold in the markets had been sacrificed to idols before it was, been, before it was put on sale. And they knew that. So the question was, as a believer in Jesus, can I eat this meat that has been previously sacrificed to an idol? Now, since idols represent no reality, no real God, they could. They were free to do so. But some of them were uneasy about that. And then there was a bigger issue. You see, many of the banquets for social clubs and guilds and things like that were held in pagan temples. It's kind of like today, uh, a lot of volunteer fire companies have nice banquet halls. And so we hold wedding receptions and banquets in places like that. Well, they would go to the local pagan temple and they'd hold a banquet there. The culture was saturated, though, with paganism. All the symbols and images would be all around them. And the issue was, suppose a new believer in Jesus who was my sibling in Christ sees me go into that temple. They don't know what I'm doing in there. They might think I'm, I'm, I used to be a believer. Now I'm going back to worshiping Isis or Jupiter or whatever. They don't know that I'm just in there for a banquet. So what about that? Paul's point is that even though our faith is not damaged by this, another weaker Christian might see us in a temple, and by our example, we might destroy the faith of that sibling in Christ. And his argument is summed up in this. He says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And anyone who claims to know something about Christian freedom does not yet have the necessary knowledge that is, the knowledge of caring about others. This is the love ethic. And he takes it to the place where he says, I won't eat meat if it's going to cause another to stumble and fall. I want you to understand that Paul is setting the bar very high here. The love ethic is not an easy one to apply in daily life. It requires some wrestling. How much are we to be bound by other people's weaknesses? It's a legitimate question. And there are many examples in today's culture of behaviors that might not harm us, but by our example could harm others. And we would not want to oppress anyone to cause them to live bent over lives. So rules are important. Don't get me wrong, especially those rules that set boundaries of personal protection or well-being. But in the end, Christ's example, in Christ's example, love rules. Love rules over rules. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So as a praying congregation and a people who seeks to let others know that God loves them too, I'm going to name for you some concerns and joys of which I'm aware, and I invite you, if you recognize some of these folk, to reach out to them with a call or a card so that we can let them know they're in our prayers or that we're sharing their joy. I bid your prayers for the family and friends of Charles, known as Chucky, who died this past Wednesday, the brother of Sharon. Sharon is a member here and I know some of you are in contact with Sharon uh, to reach out to her about the loss of her brother. I bid your prayers for the family and friends of Regina, Bill's sister-in-law, the wife of Ronnie, and the mother of Ronald and Rachel. She died this past week after battling Parkinson's. Now, she was a deep woman of faith, and she prayed every night for the Lord to take her home. It's been a long journey with Parkinson's. And I got this, this little testimony uh, in an email to me about this that now Regina is walking, pain-free, and whole again. And I thought that was really a good word. But if you know Donna and Bill who worship at 815, if you could reach out to them, uh, I'd appreciate it. I bid your prayers for Tyler, who is the 19-year-old boyfriend of a niece of Annabelle and Chet. 
Uh, he's in the Johns Hopkins Bayview Intensive Care after being seriously injured in an automobile accident in Baltimore City. And he was very soon going to enter the Baltimore County Fire Department. Things are tenuous right now. Uh, so we want to we especially pray for Tyler. And I know you'll take our prayer love to Tyler through his, his uh, girlfriend, through your niece. I bid your prayers for Jared, Linda's husband. They live down in Florida. Uh, Jared is undergoing surgery this Friday to fix complications that he's had from a knee replacement. And uh, Linda asked that we pray for skilled, a skilled surgeon to find and fix those issues. And, and some of you here I know have Linda's uh, email, and I invite you to reach out to her and Jared. I bid your prayers for Mitch, um, who, who is uh, the husband of Jessica. Mitch is at rehab um, at Autumn Lake Healthcare at Calvert Manor in Rising Sun which is too long a name to even fit on a bus. We used to just call it Calvert Manor Nursing Home, okay? But anyway, that's where he is for rehab, and please pray for Mitch and for his wife, Jessica, who is his chief advocate. And I know some of you have been to visit already. I appreciate that. I bid your prayers for Gail, the wife of Leonard, or Len. Uh, she's recovering from successful surgery. Would somebody here be willing to reach out to Gail and Len? Thank you. I bid your prayers for Reverend Stacy, the pastor of Salem United Methodist Church in Upper Falls or Kingsville. Uh, she's recovering from a bilateral uh, jaw joint replacement that went on Friday uh, as a result of great pain. So uh, just keep Reverend Stacy in your prayers. I bid your prayers for Paul, who is a friend of Ridge, uh, who is dealing with melanoma in his eye. Um, anybody here willing to reach out to Ridge? Y'all know Ridge. Thank you. I bid your prayers for Wyatt, who is the child of a friend of Michaela. Um, Michaela's a nurse. Sometimes her messages are a little bit medicalese, but this is what I take her to mean. This little guy underwent surgery to correct an anatomical placement, and other concerns were found. That's what it said. Okay, so something isn't quite right, and there's, there's further work that needs to be done for this little, this little boy. If you know Michaela or, or uh, her mother, Angela, or her grandmother, Joan, I invite you to reach out to them. I bid your prayers for Rodney, uh, who worships at 815. He's recovering from successful heart surgery. I bid your prayers for Casey, the wife of Jack and daughter-in-law of Jamie and John. This is a young mother recovering from a virus, and I know, John, you'll take our prayer love to Casey. I bid your prayers for travel mercies for Ron and Mary Bell, who are traveling to Australia and Singapore for a month for his job. I bid your prayers for um, the Cecil County Public Schools. So there's a, there's, a, there's a conversation going on between them and the county council. And there's a rally being called by the students. This is around budget. A rally for Tuesday night. Here's what I would ask you to pray. Pray for safety. These are young people. And uh, we want to make sure they're safe. Whatever else happens with that. We have a number of joys today. It is a joy to let you know that Pat, the wife of Jerry, is regaining her strength. And uh, Jerry, I, we rejoice with you in that. That is good news. Also, it's a joy to share with you that Peg, the wife of Jim, who worships at 815, is recovering well from her recent surgery. We praise God for that. It's a joy to share with you that Drew, who's the grandnephew of John and Carolyn's friend, Alan, is showing progress in his battle with cancer. Now, he has some physical limitations as a result of those treatments, and there is more treatment yet to happen but he will get to come home for a break in about a week. So he's getting a little furlough, and we just thank God for that and for the progress that is being made, and, 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 and it is expected will continue to be made. So praise God for that. And now, friends, let's go to God in silent prayer as we share with God those concerns and joys on our hearts that I've not named aloud. God of healing and of wholeness, hear your people's prayers today. Comfort the grieving, restore the injured, heal the sick and strengthen the recovering. 
God of healing and of wholeness, touch your hurting, bent over people. Agitate us, push us, and prod us, and make us mad enough to do something about a world where folk are hurting and children are hungry and, and those who look or act differently are cast aside and, and no one seems to listen to each other. Touch us that we may stand tall against the evils of our day. Guide our actions by the love ethic of Jesus that we may respect rules but set them aside when they hurt others or deny them help. God of healing and of wholeness, thank you for healing experienced or seen or heard reported. Thank you for hope restored and lives renewed. Thank you for medical progress and political breakthroughs when they come. Thank you for history regained and stories cherished and peace declared. Thank you for those times, those times when folk really see each other, really see each other as children of Abraham, through Christ our living Lord. Amen. And now let's stand in heart or, or, or body as we sing together, help us accept each other. Please be seated. And now let us praise God with our time, our talents, our gifts, and our advocacy, understanding that there are two offerings today. The, the first is the usual, and the second one is for the sacramental fund to meet local needs.
present time. Please remain standing in heart or body as we pray responsibly the prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are God from everlasting to everlasting, and yet you have created light and life for us. Our love failed, but your steadfast love, in your steadfast love, you delivered us from slavery and covenanted to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when righteousness shall roll down like flowing waters and justice like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall we learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Your Spirit anointed Him to preach good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and salvation for all people. By the suffering of His death and resurrection, and by the baptism of that experience, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death. And made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. And returning thanks to you, he broke that bread and gave it to his friends and followers, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, he took the cup. And again, returning thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so remembering your mighty saving work in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice together with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here out of love for you and upon these the gifts of field and vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever.
the loaf which we share. Is it not a sharing in the body of Christ, our crucified and risen Redeemer? The cup over which we give thanks, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ, our crucified and risen Savior? Here are the gifts of God for the people of God. We are all invited to commune. Please be seated. We are invited to take out the wafer or the bread, depending on the type of kit we have, and just hold that, if you would, for a moment so we can receive together in token of our unity in the Holy Spirit. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, broken for each of us and for all of us. Thanks be to God. And then as we open our cups, if we'll just hold those for a moment, again, so we can receive together in token of our unity in the household of faith. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, poured out for all of us and poured out for each one of us. Thanks be to God. And now, having communed with Christ our Lord and also with one another as siblings in faith, let us join our hearts and voices as we pray together. Lord Jesus, you have invited us to your table, broken the rules to include us sinners at your feast. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your grace to touch the lives of others. In your name, amen. So for this next hymn, it may be helpful to pull out your hymnal so that you can see how the notes and the words line up because the rhythms vary from stanza to stanza. It's of irregular rhythm. This hymn, by the way, I, you know, I poll the congregation once a year for your hundred favorite hymns. This hymn always gets selected. I rarely use it. It's a little challenging to sing. Nevertheless, it's a good hymn. It is the Lord's Prayer sung in the Caribbean style. So the refrain, which I know you can sing, the refrain is not hallowed be thy name, but hallowetta be thy name. And that I know you can do. Um, so with that understanding, please stand in heart or body as we sing together the Lord's Prayer.
Give yourselves a hand. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, you pulled that off. Thank you. Praise God. All right. Um, after the closing blessing, as is our practice, you can always remain seated and meditate during the postlude. As we leave the space, though, we are asked to take with us our used communion materials and place those in the trash receptacles. And now, my friends, go in peace to love and serve God and your neighbor in all that you say and do. And may the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and the mighty love of God and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen. Amen.